Uh, we have a special guest, uh, Ezra Cohen. Mr. Ezra Cohen is a VP, Corporate Strategy of Oracle, uh, specialized in national security sector, been uh, uh, serving under uh, Secretary of Defense for Intelligence and Security, and the Assistant Secretary of Defense uh, for Special Operations and Low Intensity Conflict. Uh, I think Ezra brings for many years a perspective of national security, and I'm thrilled to chat with him about uh, this subject, which is exciting for sorry, which is exciting for both of us coming from that uh, that sector. Um, so please uh, welcome Ezra, and uh, uh, let's have this. Uh, I just thought it's going to take some hours, so I just took a you know a stopwatch to make sure we're going to uh, not take too much time. So Ezra, good afternoon. Very pleased to to meet you here. Great, uh, happy to be in Israel, and uh, really glad to be here with you, Uri. Thank you. Great, thank you. And I think uh, you know the U.S. and the Israeli are sharing same thoughts of national uh, security, same troubles, maybe different sizes, different uh, locations. Um, from your perspective, what is the impact of AI on all of that? How do you envision AI taking part in, in our future uh, with national security? So I think the first thing is that, of course, the idea of autonomous vehicles is very well understood. Uh, the idea of an autonomous drones, autonomous ground vehicles uh, for defense purposes is very well understood. But I think we're going to see a lot more enablement of the targeting cycle uh, with AI. And that's everything from target identification to the interpretation of the information that comes off of a target. And I, I think a perfect example of that is uh, a couple years ago, uh, obviously, the Israeli government brought home a treasure trove of information related to the uh, Iranian nuclear program, millions of documents. Uh, the idea that you can apply an AI algorithm to that uh, to lighten the load, probably there were hundreds of thousands of hours of person analytical time that was spent going through those documents. The idea that you can now have an AI algorithm that would go through that, it's not just about finding trends or, or pieces of information that maybe you didn't connect two dots, but it's also very quickly, if, if that is related to a follow-on target, a follow-on action that needs to be taken. The idea that you can rapidly feed that follow-on action is really something that uh, I think you're going to see be extremely helpful in the national security space. But of course, all of that comes with uh, threats. Uh, Dr. Uh, ben Israel mentioned this. Uh, of course, the adversaries will also be using AI. And, uh, and so, I, so I think that it's, it's a two-sided coin. Thank you. So you mentioned this uh, circle, this target circle, and of course, one side, one side of it is the scale, the ability to digest so much data. And I think that the way we see uh, the future national security issues, they are going to be overloaded with data. So one of them is the data, and then there are uh, there is the action side, which relevant to the speed of action and the way decision uh, should be taken. Uh, what do you think is the influence of AI, the ability of AI to contribute for those decisions, for decision makers, but also for the missile decision, you know, whether to explode or not? Right. So I think on the high, high end for the policymaker, uh, the idea that you could, uh, you know, take any adversary, feed the actions of their leaders over a long period of time, over a 20-year period, into an algorithm that will help the decision maker understand what the possible red lines might be for that country. Uh, what would, how would that adversary react to certain actions that you might take? And so I think that that's very promising. I think at the more tactical level, you know, there's a lot of uh, talk about you know, killer drones, uh, basically just going all over and autonomously killing people. The reality is, is that I actually see that automation and AI will really reduce 
it has a great potential to re reduce civilian harm. That is, the, the drone and the, with an, al uh, an algorithm or an AI uh, using computer vision may actually be better at identifying civilians in the area than a human would be. Uh, and so I, I think that there are actually great benefits uh, to AI in that sense. It's not, it's not just this idea that a machine is going to be going around shooting willy-nilly. Really hope so. Uh, so from your perspective, uh, governments, well, our type of governments are uh, acting responsive, re as responsible uh, for AI actions is the way that AI is going to integrate and impact uh, national security is going to be uh, responsible. What should be done to be more on the safe side from, from that perspective? Right. So, you know, we don't, I, I'll just start here. I mean, we do not leave any weapon unsecured. We don't. But we're here talking today about all the great research that's being done at private companies around the world and at universities with, with all of these algorithms that might have uh, defense applications. And we do know that uh, there are uh, certain countries that are looking to steal this sort of technology. Uh, and just like we would secure any other weapon system, uh, any other defense research, uh, we need to really think very hard about how we're securing these algorithms, especially as they become more powerful and more suited to the battlefield. Uh, so I, I think that that's really just one thing off the bat. Um, I think another thing is, you know, we really have to think about uh, the underlying things that enable AI. Uh, the U.S. government has recently decided to restrict certain uh, microchips uh, from going to uh, uh, you know, a despotic regime. Um, I think that Israel should be very concerned about what algorithms Iran may be trying to either develop or uh, acquire overseas. So you think uh, we can look at algorithms as a weapon? And we should act it as a problem of proliferation, proliferation. And uh, like maybe we do with cyber and other data weapons, uh, we should act also to algorithms, AI algorithms and technologies of, of such matter. I, I think there's a balancing act, right? I mean, right now, uh, society is benefiting greatly and there's a lot of benefit to come from AI. So of course, we don't want to you know, restrict it. But, but AI is a dual use. Uh, technology, and uh, we have to be careful as it becomes more powerful that it doesn't fall into the enemy's hands. Um, I, I mean, that's for sure. Now, I, I'm not saying that we should be treating AI today like a nuclear weapon or anything like that, but, but there should be uh, certain procedures that are put in place. I think a lot of these companies are really very juicy targets for the adversary. Um, and frankly, you know, researchers just aren't thinking about the people that are trying to steal uh, their work, uh, maybe the way that they should be. Um, but uh, along the lines of norms, which you also asked me about, um, I think that at least in the U.S. side of things, there's still a very heavy weight towards some human in the loop. Uh, and, and the U.S. Department of Defense uh, put out a new uh, AI guidelines for use in military purposes earlier this year. And it's very clear that there's still an expectation and a weight towards a human being having the hands on the controls to some extent. I think as these algorithms become more autonomous, the risk that you face if you take the human out of the loop is, of course, uh, I think one of the main risks as a policymaker that I was concerned about was this idea of this problem of AI hallucination. Well, if the hallucination takes place from a drone that has a missile on it and it misreads a signal or misunderstands something or hallucinates, you could have an escalation uh, that would have quite significant consequences. Oh, uh, well, I couldn't agree less. I, I think uh, that from that perspective, uh, you could also look, when talking about responsibility, that those, um, well, not fully automated or autonomous uh, platforms, are, but uh, deeply deployed with AI are also vulnerable. And there should be some efforts to protect them from, you know, malwares from one side and then from uh, adversarial situations that might bring them to a kind of a inner conflict or a, or a mathematical conflict that will lead to hallucination or other states. Uh, I think that uh, 
saying that human in the loop is part of the solution is kind of challenging. Well, in many cases, it, it's, it's okay to put it that way, but when you're looking on the edge and you want the machine to take a decision at the edge, at the specific edge when you can think of national security situation, but also in real life, you cannot always bring the human in the loop to that edge. So what do you think will be the tactical point of uh, action here? I, I think like AI's use in the commercial sector, there's a degree of comfort that needs to come. Uh, and, I, and I think that part of this will come through AI moving out of a research laboratory and moving closer to the field. Uh, as militaries field test these items, they'll be more, uh, these algorithms, they will become more comfortable with the ability of the algorithms to follow rules of engagement, for instance, in an accurate way. So I, you know, one of the things I did when I was at the Pentagon was move uh, uh, MAVEN, make the decision to move Project MAVEN, which is the US Department of Defense's uh, really premier AI project, to move it out of the Pentagon bureaucracy and to the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, because I felt it was very important for the operators to become familiar with the algorithms. So I think that that's one thing. But I look, as the algorithms become more competent and advanced and, and also uh, correct in the actions they take, um, you could really envision a great use for them in what I would call communications denied environments. So for instance, take Iran, where maybe the Iranian government would be jamming communications to a drone, uh, for instance, or there are other scenarios where you could see certain adversaries taking out satellites to create a uh, communications denied environment. Having the drone or the autonomous vehicle be able to operate absent any link back to headquarters could be extremely valuable. But even in the, you know, I think having that kind of tactical operation, even in the intelligence environment, uh, you know, you and I spoke before we came up here about you know, this idea that it, uh, a, a computer implant uh, for intelligence collection purposes could have AI operating in it to, so that it's, the AI is only selecting the key piece of information that the owner of that implant wants so that less data is being exfilled, which would obviously raise uh, detection and concern. So, uh, I think those are some scenarios where I can see us heading towards a truly autonomous defense purpose. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned before moving from uh, the academic to the to the field, close to the data, close to the real life situation. Uh, I think it's strong. It strengthens the solution in both ways. First, it strengthens the technology, but also it prepares the people, the, the humans how to deal and how to act with the AI uh, technology when they have to do their, uh, their mission. Uh, how do you see in the future, uh, what is the best way to orchestrate uh, the contribution of the academic and the contribution of, let's say, the, uh, the defense sector, whether it's private or, you know, uh, government? You lost your mic. Lost my mic. Okay. Got it back. Uh, so, repeating the question, so how do you see, what is the way to orchestrate the contribution of the academic research with the different sector in a way that they can both, you know, contribute, the academics should contribute not only for defense, but also the private sector and, and everything else, but in a way that they can contribute each other and create a synergy that will provide us with better AI. So what, what is the way to do that, you know, in Israel, we have a strong defense sector, we have a strong academic, and we are looking for ways or methods to connect them together. In so the question was, if you couldn't hear, was how do you balance the needs of the defense sector to protect technology with the uh, desire of the commercial sector to have a more open uh, development environment. Look, I mean, this is this is a big problem in the United States. It's not just for AI. It's across the spectrum of uh, things that could have defense uses. I think Israel, you know, through its uh, is a smaller country, it's a little bit easier to control. And of course, many of the people that are doing the research have come out of the military, um, and, and so there's a there's a different sense than in the United States. Look, I, I mean, it's a balance, but I think there does have to be a point where 
as the algorithms advance, as the research advances, uh, just like you know, in the nuclear days from uh, from you know 60 years ago, there's a point where the technology crosses a, a threshold where there has to be more control. Uh, where that is is a is a decision of policy, but but there there is some threshold. Thank you. And if you can refer a little bit, I know. Uh, well, if we'll if we'll say something that we shouldn't, we just kill them all right. and then we clear, right? <laughs> so a uh, few weeks ago, I think. Uh, the Israeli government, the defense uh, um, uh, minister, uh, discussed how AI is going to be part of the Israeli plan towards Iran. So we have Iran as a threat, we're all familiar with that. And then suddenly someone pulled out of his pocket the AI uh, uh, label and put them together, uh, launching something like an AI major plan uh, for national security. What do you think of that? So I, I think it's a good idea. There's a lot of application for AI. We've already discussed some of them. I think one of the areas uh, that, that also beyond the kinetic uh, AI uh, supporting kinetic operations is uh, also um, in the cognitive domain. And so that is uh, not just you know, the idea that you could have, you know, hundreds of thousands of Twitter bots turning out very authentic looking content that, you know, was backed by chat GPT or something like that, that was uh, affecting and shaping the perceptions of the adversary. But the other option too is where I think AI can be helpful is in manipulating the adversary's perception of the battlefield. Uh, so of course, Iran has many sensors, they have radars, uh, they have all sorts of things, and AI has a great potential to be able to actually produce information that would uh, shape and, and also potentially make the Iranians doubt or decide not to take, a, uh, take some sort of action. So, uh, just to summarize it all, you think uh, for Israel, for Israel government to invest in AI, would it be a good idea to invest in that plan? Will it contribute to other markets, other uh, research uh, uh, sectors? Uh, is it like a good starting point to invest in AI uh, from your point of view? Well, I think the adversary is investing in AI. So uh, even if it's just a matter of, uh, of uh, matching, but really in Israel, the issue is always of maintaining an edge. And I think it is essential. Uh, certainly the US uh, very much uh, depends on Israel uh, in the Middle East. Uh, Israel has to maintain an edge uh, in AI, an edge over its adversaries in the region. Uh, and uh, even if it's not just for the defensive mechanisms that have been discussed here, uh, so that you can defend against algorithms uh, from your adversaries. Thank you very much. Thank you. So thank you as well.